Want to take a look behind the scenes at Disney's Animal Kingdom? I just watched the seventh episode of Disney Plus's new Magic of Disney's Animal Kingdom from National Geographic, so stick with me and I'll break it down after the intro. Well, hello there. My name is Jeremy and welcome back to Freeform Disney, where I talk about all aspects of Disney, from the animated movies to the theme parks to Star Wars, Marvel, and Pixar, and the TV shows, and everything else in between. And that is why it's Freeform. And keep coming back every day for new daily content. If you're not subscribed yet, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Today we're once again watching the new documentary series Magic of Disney's Animal Kingdom. The seventh episode is called The Big Egg Switcheroo. So here is what went down. Our first species we got to see today was the black and white colobuses. So these are some really cool monkeys over there and Alika's the first one we got introduced to who, hey she's just over a year old, super active, playful, bouncy, and just plain fun to watch. Now she's not the star though of the black and white call of us today. That would be Zara, who is the mother of Alika and also pregnant for the second time. And intriguingly, Disney's Animal Kingdom had never before had a pair of kids, pair of black and white call of us kids I should say, at the same time. Now we got to see how there was a lot of concern over the pregnancy. How they're having to try to estimate how long is left in the pregnancy. And that really came down to concerns over the delivery. Because the colobus at Disney's Animal Kingdom have often had unusually large babies, which is potentially dangerous. It could lead to a situation where you might need a cesarean section because that birth isn't going to be successful otherwise. You can see why that might be a little worrisome. <laughs> yeah. And we get to bring in Dr. Natalie, and she's apparently been working with Zara since she was born, which is actually pretty cool. We get to watch that whole life cycle going through. And we got to see some of the scans, getting to see the amniotic fluid as it was getting lower over time, which is one of the things they use as a major indicator for just how far progressed the pregnancy is. And we certainly got to see some of that concern too, being that the baby was not aimed in the right direction as it was nearing birth. And also, well, knowing that that amniotic fluid was getting really low, so it's like, eh, it's going to be coming soon here, hopefully. And just that the keepers had to really be on the lookout in the mornings because if something did happen, you got to go ahead and get that vet in quick to go ahead and perform that cesarean section if that does need to end up being done. And did we get to see surgery today? No, no, we did not. And actually, they came in in the morning and Zara had given birth successfully on her own. No problems there. And by the way, really neat just how they're almost pure white when they're born. That looks so different that way. And hey, that new monkey, we get to see his name because we get to go far enough along in this. So his name is Douglas. We get to watch his first appearance to the public in the exhibit. And actually see Zara has some struggles moving around while holding him. And oh, it's, it's so neat. I mean, Zara obviously has gone through this before with Alika, but eh, you, you still got to get back used to it again, right? <laughs> yeah. And apparently we even get to go uh, forward a few weeks later and get to see Alika really playing around with Douglas and you get to see Douglas's fur starting to darken in that hair color and oh, this, this, was, this was such a great note to start and end the episode on. Definitely really enjoyed this section here. It's just a barrel of fun, really. Okay, next up we had Harry the Green Turtle. So he's apparently one of, I guess, more than 300 rescued sea turtles that they've taken in over to the seas there and also generally released. Not in all cases, but a lot of them they try to if they can. Although apparently for Harry, that does not look like that's in his potential future because we find out he was recently rescued after getting a head injury from a boat. And that's why he won't be able to really get reintroduced. Now he's off in a separately enclosed back area of the seas and you get to see that net underwater that separates it from the rest. And we get to talk a lot with Aaron, our aquarist, and he's the one really working with Harry there trying to help get him ready to head into the main part of the enclosure. And oh, one of the fun pieces here, back scratches. Because we get to see him give some back scratches to a turtle through the shell because they feel that too, which that's actually really intriguing. I didn't even know that. And how Harry just wiggles his butt when he's enjoyed it in the water. 
It's so cute. It's this big old turtle like that. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That, that's, yeah, really neat right there. Okay, so let's get him over into that other part of the aquarium, right? To do that, they don't need him to be perfect to get into targets. But he does have to be what they would consider, say, at least a B plus. Because he needs to be able to come to the targets in the main area so they make sure he actually is able to get his food. Otherwise, it could be a real problem having him out there. And, well, poor Harry. I mean, we get to watch him having not a ton of success with the target. Although he does have some. And ultimately, in what is a first for the show, we finally see a story that does not end in success. Which, hey, to be honest, I think that's great. I have gotten, I, I love all the successes, but not everything is roses and sunshine. Or maybe they are roses because there are thorns too, right? Point is that there are failures. Things don't always go perfectly. It's not all a fairy tale ending. So it was nice to see one that wasn't actually that this time. Well, and essentially we do hear that Harry is making progress. So he, he was doing a little better maybe, but he never made it during the course of this episode. Poor guy. Oh, and as a little bonus section, other than our four species we're talking about, we also talked a quick bit more about the seas there. And this giant 5.7 million gallon saltwater aquarium. That's huge, by the way. Dang. <laughs> uh, we got to talk with some of the water sciences people like Patrick and Kent and talk about how they put the whole thing together and how it takes 2 million pounds of this special custom formula of salt just for that giant aquarium. Dang. <laughs> and then also the filtering process, because they process 35,000 gallons a minute through their 10 filters. Yeah, just a little bit of water right there. Two Olympic swimming pools, as they said. Nice little piece. It was just a quick little addition, but it was neat to add that in there just to get a little of the background on how things are done. Next off, we head to our third species, which is our lappet-faced vultures. So there are two of them, and they are carry and bones. Carrion bones. Or anyway. <laughs> Someone had fun with the names here, right? So the lapid-faced vultures we hear are the largest species of vulture in Africa, and they are endangered. If we go to make a mention of that, it's why they're really caring about breeding them. In fact, having looked it up elsewhere, there are less than 6,000 in the wild currently. So not that many. Now, animal keeper Trisha is the one we hear from a lot in this one, and we definitely hear because she really cares about them. She, yeah, certainly does. I mean, you can tell that. It's always nice seeing that in the keepers. I do appreciate it. Oh, there was an interesting little note that Carrie, she actually rules the exhibit and even tells, say, the kangaroos over there where they have to go. The big old kangaroo. I don't know that vulture. <laughs> That's who you listen to. <laughs> uh, it's pretty cool, actually. This story is really about them hoping to actually get a new vulture in there, help expand the species a bit. Apparently, they've been going 15 years and no successful offspring yet at this point. And really, there's only one chance per year. Essentially, they'll build a nest once per year, potentially lay in one single egg, and that's it. So if that doesn't work that year, well, there goes another year. Yeah. And then there was an emergency they had this time where it possibly could have derailed the whole thing because Bones had a really bad flight and I guess ran into a log or something, got a puncture wound? Dying, that is a bad flight for you. And then we can see Dr. Josie, who apparently is the first time that we've seen her. I don't have any recollection of seeing her before. See, there is yet another veterinarian we have not seen. And while they work really quick, we also get to hear her say these interesting mnemonics she's got for remembering certain things to do about dilution is the solution to pollution. Or everything goes better with a little bit of frosting, putting on the antiseptic cream. And hey, they get that all done and get Bones back out there within two and a half hours. Now that is pretty impressive on the timing. I, yeah, I, I got to admit that part of it impressed me more than even anything we saw in there was that they got done that fast. And hey, they got Bones back out there quick enough that it doesn't seem like it interfered with the nest building or them getting it on and getting a new egg out. And so they did. And the two laid an egg. Yay! Another chance this time. Although we're going to go a little further. So there's a reason for the name of the episode because it's called The Great Egg Switcheroo. And that title has to do with these two. So a crew of animal keepers exchanged Carrie's egg with a fake one for her to sit on. 
And they have this big old plastic wall barrier that they have to use to push Carrie away to get to the egg. Who, by the way, was clearly not happy about being separated from that egg. Yeah. And, and of course, they were successful there. No surprise. Now, I imagine in those 15 years of attempts, they've had some pretty bad failures in there, which is why they're doing the incubation side. On the other hand, maybe they've been trying that the whole time, knowing just how precarious it can be. Well, anyway, they take it off to a specialized incubator that they have. Not the only egg sitting in around there. I wonder what all birds they do have eggs in there or other animals. Interesting question. I, I guess we could find that out sometime, maybe. Probably not here. Maybe in a season two or something. Well, anyway, the egg apparently will be there for 55 days before it would come time to, I guess, be close to hatching or would hatch there. And we have Trisha coming in for weekly updates and Glory is the person that we see managing the eggs. And, well, we come in one time and find out, well, the blood vessels in that egg aren't doing good. Egg is looking hazy. Unsurprisingly, this is not a good sign. And, well, apparently days later after that visit, we find out the egg didn't make it. Again, wow. I mean, this is sad, of course. And it's another failure here. I just, wow, this episode is breaking the trend of the previous episodes in a big way. So as far as the vultures are concerned, it's onward to next year and the next chance for potentially an offspring. And if that doesn't work, the next chance and the next until they run out of time eventually, of course. So hopefully that's not where that things end up going in the long run. But it was really cool getting to meet Carrie and Bones. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It was indeed. And finally, we get to head back to our African elephants again. Now, it has actually been a while since we've seen African elephants. It was way back in the first episode that we met Mac the African Elephant. This time, we're back in here, and Nadira is the star of this one. 13-year-old Nadira. And we get to see a few other elephants in here, especially her sister Stella, who's only three, actually. But those two are a close pair right there, and certainly get to see a bit between them. And we get to hear a lot from a few different people. Animal Keeper Elizabeth, also Animal Manager Aaron. Those are the two main ones we hear from during the course of all of this. But certainly some other people in around there. And the whole big piece on this one is about trying to get Nadira to cross a bridge. Because there are two main yards for the elephants, the east and the west yards. And to get between them, the elephants have to cross a bridge. And really, they kind of do this on their own accord. Well, of course, the keepers and people will call them over and open the barrier so they actually could cross a bridge. But it's one of those they don't force any elephants across a bridge. Which, of course, forcing an elephant to do anything would be a pain anyway. For most of the elephants, not a problem at all. Whatever, they cross a bridge. It's a bridge. Whatever. <laughs> but not Nadira. For Nadira, it is a giant problem. She will not cross that. When he comes to the concrete, that's it. No further. So we even get to see a bunch of the other elephants, Mother Donna, we get to see Kinga, Vasha, and Luna, and they all go ahead and cross, and the hope is that by getting a bunch of them together, maybe that helps convince Nadira. Well, no such luck. Although it is interesting to see the uh, quote-unquote tantrum, shall we say, that Nadira tosses afterward. Just this, yeah, it's like, oh, poor Nadira. You just feel for her a little. Even the cement is just too far for her to go. And we also get to see some of the other tactics they use to try to relax Nadira before trying the bridge again. We get to see them give her a bath because she loves, loves, loves getting baths. <laughs> and uh, th it's just fun. <laughs> and you just see her just enjoying it so much right there, even crossing the legs, which is a big sign that she's really enjoying herself. And she, yeah, a ton of fun. And oh, also some treats like, oh, say, carrots. And because, remember, those two are together, you see Stella in here, too. Stella pops on over, and Stella's just stretching her trunk out so longingly for a carrot herself. The big old stretch. <laughs> Super endearing. Oh, I mean, who doesn't like a young elephant, too? They're so cute. <laughs> well, anyway, at the end of this section, we do see Nadira go for the bridge one more time. And hey, she actually gets her two front feet onto the concrete which is apparently the furthest they have ever gotten her to go. So, kind of a success? Really a failure, yes, but kind of a success. Now, having looked it up, Nadir is actually the third elephant that was ever born at Disney's Animal Kingdom way back in December of 2005. So they have been trying for a long time to get her to cross the bridge. It's like, ooh, dying. Yeah. 
And that was the end of the episode right there. And this one was definitely another good one to be sure. Funny enough, I will say I didn't actually feel as much connection to the cast members this time as usual, but I still loved the episode. And an interesting thing, I mentioned it a few times over the course of this one, but this episode was so surprising. I've gotten so used to all of the success narratives that we've been getting for every single story we see. And so I've just come to expect that those are the only kinds of stories that Nat Geo slash Disney were going to tell here about the animals. And today, well, that was certainly not the case. Three of the four stories were actually failures. And I just go, whoa, wow, <laughs> did not see that coming. And now two of them can still be deemed to potentially be making progress. And I think they would call that redefining what success is for each of those animals. Although that's not a concept that was explicitly talked about in the episode, but I do know behind the scenes that that's part of what they do and more part of what they say. Oh, and for what it's worth, it looks like there hasn't been any major progress in the past year or so since filming stopped for the series, based on what I could see and the posts they made up over on the Disney Parks blog. So still working on it and still eh, trying to get closer, right? And I really love seeing that side of everything and not seeing everything as a success every time. Uh, it, again, you always root for them to have successes, definitely, but it's nice to see a more full picture. And hey, with that, next week is already the final episode for the series. And you gotta admit, I'm sad to see it go so soon. Yes, I had some eh, a little more issues at the beginning, but I, God, <laughs> I have certainly warmed to the series since that. And I am really hoping to see Cheetahs featured next week. My favorite, favorite animals right there. Here's hoping. <laughs> uh, that said, we do know two of the species which will be featured next week. Uh, Baby Gorilla, based on the title of the episode. And the sneak peek showed us that we will finally be seeing hippos. Finally. That was one of the big ones we had to see hippos sometime. And hey, if we can see hippos, we can definitely see cheetahs too, right? Well, anyway, what about you? Who was your favorite animal this time around? For me, it was the Kalawasas, and specifically Alika, if I had to pick one. Just, what a ball of energy. And what did you think about finally seeing some failures in the show? Go ahead and let me know down below in the comments. And thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, please help me out and give it a like, a share, and please don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you back here tomorrow for another new episode of Freeform Disney. Have a magical day and may the force be with you always.